Okay. We're going to do a little etymology. Then we're going to go into the Egyptian. And then we're going to go into the astrology. I will try to keep this short. I'm going to play for you a short clip here of a man by the name of Jeff A. Benner. I'll take you to his website here in a moment. But listen to this real quick. I don't want to copyright strike, so we're going to keep it quick. Then I'm going to take you to his website where it'll be basically the same thing you're getting here in three and a half minutes, but I'm going to lead into some other things. Here we go. Okay, let's go to his website here, this one, Ancient Hebrew, ancient-hebrew.org. Now the Gion, first of all, Ion means eye, as in an eyeball, your eye. One of the ancient Semitic languages of Canaan was Ugarit. This ancient language is almost identical to the Hebrew language of the Bible, but instead of consisting of 22, it had 28 letters. One of the major differences was the letter Gion, which does not exist in Hebrew anymore. Evidence, such as will be presented here, suggests the letter Gion did originally exist within the Hebrew text of the Bible, not just within the language but within the text itself of the Bible. But at some point in the ancient past, the letter Gion began to be writ written with the letter Ion, right here. It looks like our letter Y in the modern Hebrew. The strongest evidence for the missing Gion can be found in two different meanings for one Hebrew word. As an example, the Hebrew word Ra, which in Egyptian means sun, S-U-N, can mean friend or bad. In the ancient past, the Hebrew word resh, ayin, in the modern Hebrew alphabet and identified in Strong's Dictionary 7453, meant friend. And the Hebrew word resh, gayan, also read, written as resh, ayin, in the modern Hebrew alphabet, and identified in Strong's 7451 versus 7453, means bad. Below are a few other examples of Hebrew words that are spelled with an ion, but that have more than one meaning. Infant or wicked depends on which I you're looking out of, doesn't it? Infant or wicked, prophet or goat, heed or afflict, weary or darkness, skin, blind, cold city, and on, 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 on. One with an I and one with a guy. While one word with two meanings may not seem strange to us, the English in the English language, because the English language is filled with words that have more than one meaning, this is a very rare occurrence in Hebrew, and when it does occur, it suggests that there were originally two different words. If, in fact, the letter ayin represents two ancient letters, how can we determine which letter was originally used in a given word? As an example, was the ayin in the Hebrew word strong 5584 originally spelled with an ion or a gyan. when we compare the meanings of the words in the table above you will notice that the words in the far right column are all related to darkness dark storm clouds rain blind and wickedness wicked goat city bad crafty as the hebrew word means storm which is related to the idea of darkness we can conclude that it was originally spelled with a gyan. Below are a few other words that were most likely, not for certain, but were most likely originally written with a gyan. Perverse and crooked, clouds, goats, crooked. This shift from the gyan to the ion is not unique with ancient and even modern words. Over time, words and their roots evolve. And he goes into an explanation of napkin and apron and map. 
Now this is true. Words and languages do evolve over time. But what you need to understand is that the core of languages is manufactured. Levet has said that Arabic is Greek that's been flipped and it's in cursive. Um, if you take uh, Proto-Phoenician and you flip it, it looks pretty doggone identical to English. Um, these languages are built using the core of the preceding language, and then the core is twisted and inverted and changed, and sometimes it's because of the direction of the writing, other times it's because of the direction of the philosophy. This same shift of letters can be seen many times in the evolution of Hebrew words. Within the biblical text, we have a parent root, we have child roots, there are also something called adopted roots. The idea of the letter Gayan shifting to the Ayan is not unique in the Hebrew vocabulary. In fact, it's quite common. Quite common, except that in this case, every use of the Gayan shifted over to the Ayan. Every single one. Why? It's a pretty simple question. Why? It doesn't happen that way in other languages. They're gradual changes. They're not abrupt. They're not 100%. Additional evidence to the existence of the Gaian is the Greek transliteration of Hebrew. When the Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek about 2,000 years ago, the translator transliterated the Hebrew name into Greek. An example of transliterating a name into another language can be seen in the Hebrew name which is transliterated into the Roman letters as Adam. When we examine Hebrew names that contain the Hebrew letter Ayan, we find two different methods of transliterating the letter. Table 1 contains Hebrew names where the Ayan is not transliterated because the Hebrew letter Ayan is silent, like our silent E in English, and is represented by an apostrophe in the English transliteration. Now, that's very interesting. The reason that is so interesting is because the apostrophe in English is used to denote possession or contraction. We will contract madame into yes ma'am. You know, put the apostrophe and drop the D and use an apostrophe. But it's also primarily used to denote possession. That is Bob's bike. That is Susan's coat. The apostrophe is used to denote possession. Remember that. Table 2 contains Hebrew names where the ayan is transliterated with the Greek letter gamma. Table 2, the gamma. Amora, Greek, gamora. In the English, gamora. See, so... When you put the apostrophe there, you drop the Gaian, and it becomes Amora. Well, the ones in Amora were Amorites. All right? Now, who were the Amorites? That gets really sticky really quickly. Uh, in my uh, featured channels, there's a, a gentleman over here who has done, Jay McTemmy, who's done a lot of work on that. And the Amorites is a catch-all, covers a lot of ground. He's gone verse by verse, 16 different verses across many different books, trying to track the Amorites. But it's the Gaian. It's not the I, it's the G. G. The G-H. Arabic, another modern Semitic language, has managed to retain both the ayan and the gayan as separate letters. The Arabic is kind of a squashed letter E, represents the ayan, while the squashed E with a dot above it, the dot is the difference, represents the gayan. The ancient Ugaritic also makes a distinction, and that was a cuneiform language. Same. Ancient Hebrew had two different ayan sounds. 
These sounds were represented in our English alphabet by the letter ion. One was a harsh, heavy ion. This is now lost and no longer used in Hebrew. The other was a soft, mild ion. When the, the harsh, heavy one was lost, the Gion was lost. When the Greek Jews transliterated the Bible into Greek, they had to transliterate the Hebrew names having the harsh Gion in it. This was the Septuagint. This was done 200 BC. This is not the received Masoretic text, or as I call them, the Masri eats, having the harsh Gion in it. How hard a sound it must have been. This Gion has even come all the way down to English. The Hebrew place names, both of which have this strong Gion, were transliterated into Greek as Gamora and Gaza. Didn't the odd forms of these place names in English ever puzzle you? In medieval times, there was an export from Gaza, a thin fabric which was naturally named Gaaz, after the city of its origin. Incidentally, Arabic, a close sister language of Hebrew, still pronounces these two ions differently, and that, and what's more, writes them differently. So, you've got the ion and the gion. And it's shown by a dot. On top of the Arabic E. But here, you see it. This is a this is the letter Gion right here. Right here. All right. Going back to the Arabic, this Hebrew letter Gion with the three loops and the twist at the top in the Egyptian alphabet. It was the letter H. It had a dot underneath it. It was a lowercase h with a dot underneath it. And it was called the wick, used for torches. Remember that. Also, this is a reed. Our letter Y. Reeds were used for writing. Reeds were used for writing. They were like quill pens, see. This, can I zoom in on it? Yes, I can, good. Where is the man's name here? There it is. This I found in numerous places around the internet. Douglas Petrovich. This is his work. Across the top, you have what the reconstructed or projected Proto-Hebrew original alphabet was. You've got the Middle Egyptian hieroglyphic, which they have examples of. You've got the original Hebrew alphabet. And we'll just ignore these for now on the right-hand side. You've got your Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Daleth, Hey, Wa, and Zion, and then Chet. And look down here at Chet, or Heth. This is a projected reconstruction. This is what they have evidence of. This is the H, with the dot under it for this wick, which later became the Gion, which was dropped. Now, Gion is, I want to say, the 16th letter. Where are you, darling? Doot, doot, there you are. Right here. It means the eye. But the Gion ended up becoming the Chet, or the Heth, or the Cheth. These symbols mean things as well. If you've got a really sharp eye, you'll see this in the front of the house, uh, sketched on the blackboard uh, in the uh, My Pet Goat 2. And that chet means flesh, fence, 
enclosure or destruction. That's what it means. And it came into the Hebrew from the Egyptian. This wick for a lamp. Okay. Hazer, H A Z E R. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. When we get to Deborah and Barak, the song of Deborah and Barak. Very interesting. So, all right. Come back over here. Now Balaam and Balak. Pithor is known as the place where the prophet Balaam is from. Balaam means swallowing up or destroyer of the people. And he is from Pithor which means interpreter. Now, it says here to interpret dreams. No, when you read down here, it's not about dreams. It's a stretch to make it about dreams. Um, Christ's father, Joseph, interpreted dreams. Uh, Joseph in Egypt interpreted dreams. For the Pharaoh, for the Pharaoh's cupbearer, for the Pharaoh's baker. And it's interesting to note that it said, isn't the work of interpreting dreams should be left to God? And they said, tell me your dream. Think about that. But it means interpreter. Not of dreams, just interpreter. Now, Balaam, Moses Maimonides has said that anything weird in the Bible needs a second look. And the whole Balaam Balak thing is weird. He is a diviner, a prophet for hire. He doesn't want to go, but he ends up going. Then his donkey talks to him. Why does his donkey talk to him? Well, the donkey, a female donkey, when you break down and you get into the etymology and you go back and you look at the lexicon, the donkey he was riding was not a male donkey, not a chamor or a hamor, which means red. It's a different word and it means the female donkey. He was riding a female donkey then he was beating on it because it wouldn't do what he wanted it to do. It turned aside from doing what he wanted to do. It did this three times. And in the process, it crushed his foot. This is in Numbers 22. It crushed his foot. It crushed part of his understanding. It made him lame. Anyway, the angel of the Lord appears finally. After the donkey says, why have you beaten on me these last three times? Haven't I always done this? Haven't I always taken you where you wanted to go? Balaam is super pissed off. He said, I'd kill you if I could right now. The angel of the Lord appears and said, I'd kill you if it wasn't for her. Balaam gets all sorry and repentant. All the angel has to do to get this reaction out of him is to threaten him. Doesn't work that way with all of us. Anyway, he says, I'll go back. No, the angel says, you go on. But you say only what you're told to say. And so Balaam goes on. 
And then after three series of seven altars and a bull and a ram on each one. Do you hear me? A bull and a ram on each of seven altars as a sacrifice. He goes on and makes all of his predictions, makes all of his prophecies. He prophesies, and he prophesies for money. And he blesses Israel up one side and down the other for all the good it does, because Israel still kills him. Israel or Jacob still kills him in the end. Here's the thing. We've got a crippled prophet who doesn't like doing what he's told, who likes the money. He's riding a feminine donkey. And Balaam is from Pithor. Pithor meaning interpreter. Let's do this. Let's go back here. Maybe we missed this. Oh, yeah, there we go. Peor. Should have been Pogor. Elsewhere, when you dig into this, you find out that that Gaian in Hebrew would be pronounced with an NG sound. An NG sound. A ning. Nengang. Not a gah, but a nengah which is weird in my book. But that NG is interesting because in grammar you have a couple of different major constructs. The SVO is the subject verb object. Bob, go to the store. You've also got the OVS, object verb subject, to the store, go Bob. Two ways of constructing sentences. You just flip the sentences. Then you also have the NG, which means possession or ownership, like our apostrophe. See? Possession or ownership. They don't even bother with it anymore. Pogor, P or Pogor. Peor. Swallowing up of the people belong. Peor. Opening to open wide the Baal, the Lord of Peor, the Moabite God. He addresses Israel from the top of Mount Peor, the opening. 
Ball Peor. Ball Peor. Let's just say that two girls, one cup was right up his alley. He'd be perfectly at home in some Berlin sex shop, okay? And we'll just leave it at that. That's the kind of God Baal Peor was. You want to look him up on Google? You go right on ahead. That's what I did. Anyway, <clears throat> but see, they dropped the guy in. They dropped the guy in, didn't they? You remember? It was the wick. It came into the Hebrew via the H. See, via the H. And it landed inside the chet, inside the fence, inside the enclosure, inside the destruction. Just so you know, I'm not pulling that out of my ass. Meaning again unknown, according to first, it means fence in, destroy. First also thinks it has to do with a fence, but it could equally possibly be the symbol of stacking stones. They're always stacking those stones. Note that the ta in pre-biblical Hebrew often became the hey in biblical times, which brings to mind the verb heya, meaning to live. Or hayut means of livelihood. Beast. That's what the Google algorithms give it. Live, alive, living beast. What does the Yid say? It's Yiddish. The root is K-H-S. Sometimes you can unbibble some of the babble if you go to Yiddish because you can get the uh, either down here or over here you can get the roots. K-H-S. File that away for later. KHS. Anyway, to open wide, destroyer, fence in, the number eight, which is the number of circumcision. So, you kind of once you're circumcised, you've kind of got to make a choice. Which way you're going to go? And see, the angel threatens him. What did I do that for? I don't want that. Latin norm. 
standard pattern or model from the French norma, Latin norma, carpenter's square, rule, pattern, word of unknown origin. Really? We'll see about that. Klein suggests a borrowing via Etruscan, where we get the Latin alphabet, a Greek nomon, carpenter's square. The Latin form of the word norma was used in English in the sense of carpenter square from the 1670s, also the name of a small, faint southern constellation introduced in the 18th century by, Le we'll call it LaSalle. This is the constellation Norma. Looks for all the world like a letter K, doesn't it? With the carpenters, or the uh, compass down here. Circinus, Circinus, not sure how you pronounce that. Norma. Well, my, my, my. What do we have here? A wick. And a carpenter square. And a mouth and devouring. Norma was drawn by Johann Bode in the Uranographia as either a ruler or a level, overlaying a carpenter square. Latin word carpenter square, Norma et regula. The square and ruler. Various no, variously known as the rule, the carpenter square, the set square, the level. An L-shaped instrument for drawing right angles. Right angles. The constellation Norma, the carpenter square, and its adjoining circinus. Pair of compasses for drawing circles. The older association. Nuwa and Fuxi, unearthed in Xinjiang, holding the tools. <clears throat> man named Nibley gave a lecture in 75 on sacred vestment. Click on it, it's gone. I can't find it on archive.org either. In which he says in the underground tomb of Fan Ye Si, AD 689. This is hundreds of years after uh, Constantine. Two painted silk veils show the first ancestors of the Chinese, their entwined serpent bodies rotating around the invisible vertical axis mundi. He holds a set square in the plumb bob and he rules the four, cor the four cornered earth. Since when is Gaia feminine, curved feminine, have corners? While his sister wife, Nuwa, holds the compass pointing up as she rules the circling heavens. In the ancient Babylonian astrology, the watchers that Enoch gave you, there were four of them. There were four watchers in the heavens, four corners in the heavens. It was Fomalhalt, it was Antares, it was uh, Regula, and it was Aldebaran. You had four corners in the heavens in Babylon, and you had a round earth. And then these clowns got a hold of it, and they reversed everything. I have a clear memory of the book of Jude. Now, I hadn't looked at it in three or four years was the last time I'd read it. It's not a hard read. It's like a page and a paragraph in print. And it clearly said at that time, 
Certain men crept in unaware, consigned to condemnation from the beginning, and they turned everything around. That was the line. That is what it said. And now that line, just like Berenstein, just like nine and a half billion people, just like the Sagittarius arm, just like, no, Luke, I am your father, and 125,000 other things are just different and gone. They never existed. I've heard people say that the Mandela effect is about residual. Well, if there's residual for it, then it's a Mandela effect, and if there isn't, there's not. And to them I say, wrong. It's about attention. What draws your attention? Now, I've seen people have long discussions about Pikachu, this little yellow China or Japanese whatever character, cartoon character. Does he have a black stripe on his tail or not? How the hell would I know? I was trying to hold a marriage together, you know, working three jobs. Paying for two uh, 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 college tuitions? How the hell was I supposed to know anything about friggin' Pikachu? It wasn't on my radar. But Lion and Lamb? <laughs> You're talking archetype, baby. That got everybody's attention, didn't it? Lion, Lamb, two L's. Carnivorous, dangerous, huge fangs, sweet, little, innocent, fluffy, herbivore and cute too never mind the fact the whole lion of the or the lamb of god thing if there was ever an archetype that's it it's got archetype written all over it that got everybody's attention and therefore it turned out tons and tons of derivative work it's a recursive algorithm like an infinity mirror tons and tons of derivative derivations. Let's see if I can find this. No. You can still find the same sentiment, though, in Isaiah. Isaiah's got a ton of Mandela effects, too. But you can still find it here. Woe to those who dig deep to hide their plans from the Lord. In darkness they do their works and say, Who sees us? Who will know? You have turned things upside down, as if the potter were regarded as clay. Shall what is formed say to him who formed it, He did not make me? Can the pottery say of the potter, He has no understanding? At some point now, within the next two to five years, that will disappear, I would imagine, but maybe not. I'm not exactly setting the world on fire with my videos, and that's all right. That's a okay. The circling heavens, they turned everything upside down. The phrase, Ku Chi Chu, used by modern Chinese to signify the way things should be, the moral standard, the devourer, the destroyer. The two characters surrounded by the constellations of Hu Sui, Fu, Fu Sui and Nu Kwa, the craftsman god, and his Peredra. No, there are four craftsmen. There are four craftsmen. You can find that in the Old Testament too. There are four of them. They're the four watchers. This is why Enoch and lying Hermes and Thoth and Isdras and Cadmus have had to do their goddamnedest to gut them. People think they found the truth with Enoch. They did not. They found another lie. I'm sorry. It's just the way it is.
Not because I say it is. Because the evidence shows it is. Who measures the squareness of the earth and the roundness of heaven with their implements. Angles are masculine. Angles are masculine. Curves are feminine. The square, the plumb bob, compass, intertwined serpent-like bodies. The word norma comes from the Latin norma, carpenter square, rule, pattern, precept, derivative knowledge. G-N-O. They took the G-N, the knowing, and they gave us the N-G, the possessing. I'm not firmly convinced that the K means spirit. I think that's another lie we've been fed. I'm still digging on that. And I could be wrong. But I kind of don't think so. Nomen, the style of a sundial that projects a shadow used as an indicator. Gnosis intuitive apprehension of spiritual truths. They took the Gnosis and they gave us rule. They gave us possession. Bell, possessor, and owner. And they hate Daniel. Jesus, they hate Daniel. They hate Dan. These damn lying scribes. When you go back to the J and E source, oh wait, let's do this first. The elements. They're named after the first three letters of the Etruscan alphabet. L M N. Their alphabet didn't start with A B C or Aleph, Bet, Gimel, or Alpha, Beta, Gamma. It started with L, M, N. And in turn, we have L, M, Ns. Thirteen books of geometry and mathematics. <sighs> Designed on site. It's Stoichia, or Stoichnoma, which means element, fundamental building block denotes the idea of a first principle of the cosmos, stoichio, to teach the basics, stoichimata, the twelve signs of the zodiac, stoichion, letter of the alphabet. Look at this, the letters of the alphabet, the signs of the zodiac, the elements. There is nothing that they don't own. This mouth, this destroyer, this devourer. Why and how might the word stoichia have acquired the meaning of letter of alphabet, which is usually denoted by the word grammata? Let us create a mental image of a sundial. We see a rod or a stylus. The sun shines and the stylus, stylus casts a shadow. And the fable of Plato's cave, where we're miserable humans change fast to the seat so we cannot move and only watch the shadows, forever entertaining ourselves, guessing what these shadows mean and what they stand for. The connection to the stoichia, which means element, fundamental building block, becomes immediately clear. The symbols of the alphabet are viewed as the shaped holes through which the pure light of the divine logos shines. You can find much the same sentiment expressed in here on this page. This They're not going to tell you the doc means Jupiter. They're not going to tell you. Michael Heiser won't do it. I waited three hours one night to see if he would. He wouldn't even go. He barely brushed up against the shamash in the sun. 
he wouldn't go to the dock in Jupiter. The symbols of the alphabet are viewed as the shaped holes through which the pure light of the divine logos shines. What a load of shit. There is no polite way to say it. Well, there is. I'm just not good enough. The shadows that are cast on the dial of the sundial of the cave walls are the meanings of those symbols as we perceive them from our lowly perspective. The Logos is not alphabetical, nor is it a symbol, nor is it a word, nor is it anything that you've been told it is. The next one, I'll tell you what the Logos really is versus what these lying fuckers tell you it is. I've had it. I don't know whether I'm casting idols before Israel or not. They say Balaam cast idols before Israel. The error of Balaam. After he blessed Israel up one side and down the other, you know. He still killed him. Well, he came from a bad place. He devours the people. In the interest of full disclosure, because the truth is the only thing that ever mattered to me, really, ever really mattered. I was a Mason. I was a third degree Mason. And then I was a Shriner. And I loved that little hat. I loved that fez. I burned it. I burned it a couple of years ago. You know, Goddard said it's a play, and I'm convinced it's a program. And he said creation was finished. Everything is exactly as it should be, and it plays out exactly as it's supposed to. You know, and Joseph, when the boys found out who he was in Egypt, they thought they were toast. And Joseph said, no. He said, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. You know, and I understand that. I get that. I can see that there's a bigger picture that we don't understand. I can understand that much. But you know, in the 20th century, alone, alone, somewhere between 150 million and a quarter of a billion people died as sacrifices to these cocksuckers in their wars and to make sure that they had a constant supply of little children to defile and debase and ruin. They're all part of the same fucking outfit. They're all Amorites. They're all explainers. They're all interpreters. And they all twist everything. They twist everything. And Christ said, by their deeds, ye shall know them.
there's only one reason I would have been shown all this. Because Ephraim is an unwise son. And when the time comes to be born, he doesn't present himself at the opening. His iniquity is stored up. And I'm not looking forward to that. But I had to have the damn truth. You know, if there's ever anything you can use here, anything you've learned, anything that leads you to something else, bravo, bravo. Make it your own. Take it and run with it. I don't need any credit. I don't want any. Like, share, subscribe? I don't think so. I don't think so. Because before we're done, I'll have insulted and pissed off everybody, I think. Because I'm just putting it all out there. Fuck it. There will nothing remain unknown. Everything I see, I'm going to tell you. Fuck them. Man or God, fuck them. Like Captain America told, uh, what's his name? The guy with the eye patch. It all goes. So anyway, listen, be good to each other. And do a better job of forgiving than I do. Six hundred and thirteen commandments. That's what Moses gave him. Six hundred and thirteen. Christ boiled it down to two. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And love one another as I have loved you. We have so far to go and so little time to get there. Be well. God bless. We'll talk again. See if I can turn this off this time. <laughs>